Plato defines rhetoric as the art of winning the soul by discourse. Aristotle views it as the faculty of discovering in any particular case all of the available means of persuasion. Cicero says it's a speech designed to persuade. No matter what you think the correct definition of rhetoric is, there is one unavoidable truth. It is everywhere. We come into contact with rhetoric multiple times a day, every day. There is no avoiding it, whether we turn on the TV, drive on the interstate, or surf the internet. Instead of trying to avoid it or condemn it, we should embrace it and use it for the common good. So here's the thing about Plato, folks. He was really into having a pure soul. He was convinced that it would bring a person closer to the gods. Way back when, the sophists were teachers for hire who would go around using rhetoric to lie and manipulate people in order to get what they wanted from their audience. Plato, being such an upstanding guy, thought that this was a pretty lousy way to live. In his Gorgias, he explained his belief was that the practice of false rhetoric would corrupt the soul and ruin both the orator and his audience. But naturally, Plato wasn't about to leave us all hanging. He came up with a counter-argument, true rhetoric, or dialectic. In his Phaedrus, Plato asserted that the practice of dialectic would cleanse the orator's soul. But how would one practice dialectic? By doing what's best for your audience, which can be accomplished by telling the truth as best as you know it. The truth that is as close to truth with a capital T as possible. Capital T truth was the truth that exists in what Plato called the noumenal world, i.e. where the gods lived. Moving past the religious jargon, Plato's idea that rhetoric could be used for both the common good and the good of the rhetorician by just telling the truth and trying to do what's best for your audience redefine the concept of rhetoric from something negative to something beneficial for all who come in contact with it. Best for your audience redefine the concept of rhetoric from something negative to something beneficial for all who come in contact with it. He proved that even though rhetoric could be used for evil, it doesn't have to be and shouldn't. This idea paved the way for further speculation of all the good rhetoric could do for society. Aristotle was one of the most influential rhetoricians in history. His contributions to modern-day speech are still used today. Particularly, his theory about artistic proofs hidden in internal speech is still relevant today. The three artistic proofs are logos, pathos, and ethos. Logos is the means of persuasion through reasoning. In terms of speech writing, this is the content in the speech. Pathos is the emotional appeal to the audience. It helps the audience get invested in the speech or any other form of rhetoric. For example, the ASPCA commercials are full of pathos by playing Angel by Sarah McLachlan and showing pictures of sad animals. By doing this, they're hoping to play on the audience's emotions and sway them to donate to their cause. Ethos is the rhetor's character. It can either be established before the speech simply by knowing the character of the speaker or by verbally citing credible sources in your speech. All three artistic proofs must work together. One without the others doesn't compose an effective speech or any other form of rhetoric. Another important contribution that Aristotle made to the practice of rhetoric was his three genres of rhetoric. They are deliberative, forensic, and epideictic. Deliberative rhetoric aims to persuade. It is most commonly seen today in political speech. In the following example, Stephen Colbert and Bill O'Reilly both demonstrate deliberative rhetoric when they try to persuade the other to agree with their viewpoint on politics. What's your audience? Do you do research? Do you know who... Well, Bill, that's one of the reasons I want to do my show, okay? I emulate you, Yeah. and I want to bring your message of love and peace, which I understand that is your message. It is. I want to bring the message of love and peace to a younger audience, people in their 60s, people in their 50s, people who don't watch your show. Okay, so people in their 50s and 60s, too young for the factor, right? Uh, are watching your show. Because we did a study of Jon Stewart's show. Yeah. That guy? And, yeah, and it was stone slacker that were watching his show across Absolutely. the board. Absolutely. You right. have to be high to understand John Stewart. Forensic rhetoric either accuses or defends the action of a group or person. It's commonly used today in courtrooms. In this example, Elle Woods accuses her witness of lying about her alibi. Miss Wyndham, what had you done earlier that day? I got up, got a latte, went to the gym, got a perm, and came home. Well, you got in the shower? I believe the witness has made it clear that she was in the shower. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Your Honor. Um, Miss Wyndham, had you ever gotten a perm before? Yes. How many would you say? Two a year since I was 12. You do the math. 
You know, a girl in my sorority, Tracy Marcinko, got a perm once. We all tried to talk her out of it. Curls weren't a good look for her. Have your bone structure. Oh. But thankfully, that same day, she entered the Beta Delta Pi wet t-shirt contest where she was completely hosed down from head to toe. Objection. Why is this relevant? Oh, I have a point, I promise. Then make it. Yes. Um, Chutney, why is it that Tracy Marcinko's curls were ruined when she got hosed down? Because they got wet? Exactly. Because isn't it the first cardinal rule of perm maintenance that you're forbidden to wet your hair for at least 24 hours after getting a perm at the activating the ammonium thyglocalate? Yes. And wouldn't somebody who's had, say, 30 perms before in their life be well aware of this rule? And if, in fact, you weren't washing your hair, as I suspect you weren't because your curls are still intact, wouldn't you have heard the gunshot? And if, in fact, you had heard the gunshot, Brooke Wyndham wouldn't have had time to hide the gun before you got downstairs, which would mean that you would have had to have found Mrs. Wyndham with a gun in her hand to make your story plausible. Isn't that right? She's my age. Did she tell you that? How would you feel if your father married someone who was your age? You, however, had time to hide the gun, didn't you, Chutney? After you shot your father. I didn't mean to shoot him. I thought it was you walking through the door. Order, order. Order. Oh, oh my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Bailiff, take the witness into custody where she will be charged for the murder of Hayworth Wyndham. In the matter of the state versus Brooke Wyndham, this case is dismissed. Mrs. Wyndham, you're free to go. Epidictic rhetoric either praises or blames. It's commonly used in ceremonial speeches like funerals, graduations, and weddings. In the following bridesmaids clip, both Helen and Annie go back and forth making wedding toasts. Kap kun ka. Kap kun ka. Kap kun ka. Kap. And that's it for tonight. Thank you for coming. Really quick. Thank you just, all for coming. I just wanted to say really Dessert quick. Dessert wine is out. <laughs> Consuelo? Really quick. Speaking of Consuelo, Lillian and I took Spanish together in school. And so I would just like to say to you and to everyone here, gracias para vivar en la casa, en las escuelas, and... El azul marcada tienes con vivir en las fortuas. And gracias. <laughs> oh. Thank you. I feel so close to you and can trust you. You're my angel and soulmate. And I feel I can communicate with you with simply a look. Thank you for coming. Yep, I got it. Lillian. Keep smiling, keep shining, knowing you can always count on me for sure. That's what friends are for. In good time. Cicero believed that rhetoric could benefit society if orators utilize the five canons of rhetoric. The first canon is invention, the process of developing and refining your arguments. The second is arrangement, the process of arranging and organizing your arguments for maximum impact. The third is style, the process of determining how you present your arguments using figures of speech and other rhetorical techniques. The fourth is memory, the process of learning and memorizing your speech so you can deliver it without the use of notes. Memory work not only consisted of memorizing the words of a specific speech, but also storing up famous quotes, literary references, and other facts that could be used in impromptu speeches. The fifth is delivery. The process of practicing how you deliver your speech using gestures, pronunciation, and tone of voice. The following is a clip from the movie V for Vendetta. There are, of course, those who do not want us to speak. We think, just let me I think. I suspect even now, orders are being shouted into telephones and men with guns will soon be on their way. It's chance of that. Damn it! Why? Because while the truncheon may be used in lieu of conversation, words will always retain their power. Words offer the means to meaning, and for those who will listen, the enunciation of truth. And the truth is, 
There is something terribly wrong with this country, isn't there? You designed it, sir. You wanted it foolproof. You taught me every television in London. Cruelty and injustice, intolerance and oppression. And where once you had the freedom to object, to think and speak as you saw fit, you now have sensors and systems of surveillance coercing your conformity and soliciting your submission. We need cameras. How did this happen? Who's to blame? Well, certainly there are those who are more responsible than others, and they will be held accountable. But again, truth be told, if you're looking for the guilty, you need only look into a mirror. Let's start with invention. If you've ever seen the film, the masked guy, V, took about 20 years reading every book ever, so his process of developing his argument was rather extensive. Also, memory applies here because he had 20 years. Memorization probably wasn't an obstacle. But what about arrangement style and delivery? V calmly addresses his audience like he's an amiable talk show host, even though his message is rather serious. He explains that the government is repressive and then tells the citizens that it's also their fault. But he finishes by telling them it's okay, they just need to revolt. The way he played his argument, he showed the audience that they can and should do something to better their lives. This relates to style and delivery in that he was cool, calm, and collected. But he also made it inspirational. He showed his audience that it's not only okay, but also necessary to stand up for a better tomorrow. Plato's idea of true rhetoric, Aristotle's types of speech and his artistic proofs, as well as Cicero's five canons all support the assertion that rhetoric, when used properly, does benefit both the rhetorician and his audience, and therefore society.